welcome to the first lesson of the ninth module which is on stability of columns part 1. Uh, in fact, uh, in the previous modules we have discussed uh, certain aspects of the stresses in members and consequently we have looked into the effect of bending in a member where we have evaluated the deflection of the member. Now, in this particular lesson we are going to discuss a different aspect which is a stability of a member which we designate as column. Now, it is expected that once this particular lesson is completed, one should be able to understand the concept of buckling of column members. In fact, we will define what we uh, mean by column member, which member we call we term as column and then uh, we look into certain characteristic uh, features which we call as buckling. So, buckling of column members under axial compressive load and uh, one should be in a position to evaluate critical buckling load in column members of different types. Now, uh, we will look into that what we really mean by uh, critical buckling load that the member uh, which is subjected to axial compressive load uh, in which, uh, which load is going to buckle or deform. The scope of this particular lesson therefore, includes the recapitulation of previous lesson. In fact, uh, the last module we have uh, looked into the aspects of the combined stresses. Uh, we will look into the certain aspects of the combined stresses while answering the questions related to that. And uh, this particular lesson includes the concept of stability of column members, evaluation of critical buckling load in different types of column members. Now, the different types of column members we mean uh, we look into that what are the different types of supports the column members have and uh, what are the contribution of the axial load in the buckling of those members. And then uh, we will look into some examples for the evaluation of buckling loads uh, in columns. Well, now let us look into the questions uh, which were given in the last lesson. The first question was that how will you evaluate the combined stresses if the member is subjected to axial load and torsion simultaneously. Now, uh, as I said that the previous lesson we had uh, discussed about the uh, concept of the combined stresses and you had seen that if a particular member is subjected to an axial pull P along with a twisting moment T, then what will be the effect of this combined loading in the member. Now, as you know that the axial load which is acting in the member which is concentric that means acting through the center of gravity of the member uh, will contribute to the normal stress sigma which is equals to P divided by the cross sectional area. So, everywhere which wherever you take the element on the surface uh, you will get or in interior at any point the normal stress will be equals to P divided by A and the contribution of the twisting moment T. Uh, will be in the form of shearing stress as we have seen while discussing the effect of the torsion on member. So, thereby uh, if we take an element this will be subjected to the normal stress sigma and the shearing stress tau. And as you know that if a particular element is subjected to the combined action of the normal stress and the shearing stress, we can plot these stresses in the Mohr circle uh, in terms of sigma and tau and then uh, we can compute the value of the maximum normal stress which we call as uh, sigma 1 and the minimum normal stress which we call as sigma 2. Uh, in we call these also as principal stresses and the maximum value of the shearing stress which we call as tau, tau max. So, these stresses we can uh, evaluate when they are subjected to the combined action of the axial load and the torsion. So, when a member is subjected to the axial pull or axial compressive force and a twisting moment the resulting stresses are the normal stress and the shearing stress. Shearing stress comes from the twisting action and then when uh, uh, normal stress and shearing stress act simultaneously we can compute the values of the maximum tensile or compressive stresses and the maximum value of the shearing stresses in the member. Now, the second question posed was how will you evaluate the principal stresses? if a pressure vessel is supported on two supports at a distance apart. Now, uh, as you had seen that a pressure vessel when it is uh, subjected to uh, some liquid which is exerting pressure on the container, uh, we get two types of stresses which we call as sigma C the circumferential stress or the hoop stress 
which is given by sigma c equals to p r by t. Consequently, uh, we get the norm uh, longitudinal stress which we call as sigma l which is equals to p r by 2 t where p is the internal pressure, r is the radius the outer radius of the uh, cylindrical vessel and t is the thickness of the vessel. So, these are the stresses the sigma c and sigma l the circumferential stress and the longitudinal stress that we get on the surface. Now, when this particular vessel is supported on two supports thereby uh, if we take the weight of this container along with the contained liquid, uh, we can uh, idealize that particular form uh, in this particular form where we have two supports with a load which is distributed over the entire length of the vessel. The entire length of the vessel we can consider as a beam member which is subjected to its own weight along with the contained liquid and supported at these two points let us call they as, as A and B. Now, as you know this particular beam member when it is subjected to a load of Q uniformly distributed we will get a moment diagram which will uh, look like this. Now, because of this bending uh, there will be bending stresses and as you know the bending stress introduces the normal stress which is m y by i and this uh, depending on the position of the element it could be compressive or tensile uh, uh, when you are talking about with reference to the neutral axis. So, thereby that will contribute to the normal stress. Now, this stress the normal stress due to bending will get added or subtracted from the uh, longitudinal or the normal stress we get from the pressure vessel and they are uh, shown over here. Now, P r by 2 t is the contribution from the pressure vessel and m y by i is the contribution from the bending. So, this will give us the resulting normal stress and uh, uh, in the in the x direction and this will give the normal stress in the y direction. Now, in this particular problem of course, uh, we have not considered the effect of the shearing stress. However, if we compute the value of the shear uh, there will be effect of the shearing stress as well. But in the if we do not consider the shearing effect, then this element will be subjected to the normal stress sigma x and sigma y. And from this again sigma x and sigma y since there are no shearing stresses on this element, these are the principal stresses or the maximum value of the uh, uh, stresses the maximum tensile stresses that will be occurring in the x and y direction. And uh, you know at any direction we can compute the stress based on these stresses. Well, the third question was that uh, on a road sign which we normally use the what kind of uh, stresses this will induce the wind load will induce in the vertical member. Now, as you have seen that uh, the road sign which is uh, projecting from a vertical shaft uh, is subjected to the, uh, the normal when the wind acts normal to this particular plate uh, it will be subjected to the wind force which will be acting through the center of gravity of this particular plate. And if we call this load as P, this load if we transfer to the vertical shaft member, it will be transmitted with a twisting moment T. So, if we idealize this particular member in this form like you have a beam which is subjected to a lateral load P and a twisting moment T. Now, this lateral load P uh, will produce a maximum bending moment at the support which is equals to if we call this distance as A. Uh, P times A is the bending moment over here and this P A moment will introduce the normal stress sigma which is equals to m y by i. Also at this section there will be shearing stress because of the uh, shear force due to load P and that is equals to tau as equals to V q by i b. And the twisting moment T will have the stress here uh, will produce shearing stress which is tau which is equals to uh, as you know that t by j is equals to tau by rho. So, this is t rho by j. So, uh, the total effect of the shearing stress you will have from the twisting moment as well as from the shearing force and there will be normal stress because of the bending. So, uh, the member vertical member which is subjected to uh, uh, wind load the, the road sign which is subjected to the wind load uh, will have the combined effect of the bending stress, the shearing stress and the shearing stress from the twisting moment. And once we know the normal stress and the shearing stress, then we can compute the value of the uh, maximum value of the normal stresses or maximum principal stresses. If we plot them in a Mohr circle, we can compute the value of sigma 1 and sigma 2 which are the maximum uh, normal stresses and thereby they are the principal stresses. 
Well, uh, before we go into the stability aspects, uh, let me discuss the problem which I had uh, assigned to you last time and this is related to the combined effect of the bending and the twisting moment in a member. A uh, steel shaft of diameter D which is unknown is subjected to a bending moment of 1.2 kilo Newton meter and a torsion of 0.3 kilo Newton meter. Now, if the allowable tensile and shear stresses are 80 mega Pascal and 40 mega Pascal respectively, uh, we will have to determine the diameter D of the shaft. So, this is a situation where the shaft is subjected to the combined action of bending moment and the twisting moment. Now, uh, when the member is subjected to the combined action of bending moment and twisting moment, then uh, we get the stresses in this form. Say for example, uh, if we have the shaft of diameter D, then uh, as we know the sigma is equals to m y by i and y here is the maximum uh, distance from the neutral axis which is d by 2. So, this is equals to m times d by 2 and i is pi d 4 by 64. So, this if you uh, compute it, it comes as 32 m by pi d q and this is what is indicated over here that sigma x the normal stress which is arising due to bending is equals to 32 m by pi d cube. And here all the parameters are known because bending moment is given as 1.2 kilo Newton meter which is into 10 to the power 6 Newton millimeter and d is the uh, parameter which we will have to define and if we compute this, this comes as 38.4 into 10 to the power 6 by pi d cube. Now uh, consequently when we have the twisting moment that will introduce the shearing stress and again as you know that uh, the value of the shearing stress will be equals to T rho by j and that is uh, if we can compute tau is equals to T rho by j. You know rho is the maximum distance from the center which is d by 2 again. So, T d by 2 and j is the polar moment of inertia which is pi d cube by 32. So, uh, pi d 4 by 32. So, then it becomes as equals to 16 T by pi d cube. So, this is the shearing stress which is getting generated because of the twisting moment T. Now, here also except D all other parameters are known the twisting moment is 0.3 kilo Newton meter and thereby tau x y comes as 4.8 into 10 to the power 6 divided by pi d cube. Now, when you have this normal stress sigma x and tau x y, uh, we can compute the value of the maximum tensile stress sigma 1 either using Mohr circle or using uh, the transformation equation and which is uh, sigma 1 equals to sigma x plus sigma y by 2. Now, here sigma y being 0, so this is sigma x by 2 and since it is maximum tensile stress that is why you have taken the sign plus equals to root the radius which is sigma x minus sigma y by 2 square plus tau x y square and sigma y being 0 again this is sigma x by 2 square plus tau x y square. Now, if we substitute the values of sigma x and tau x y in this expression. Uh, sigma x by 2 is 19.2 uh, and this is of course 10 to the power 6 divided by pi d cube has been taken out and this is root of 19.2 square plus 4.8 square which is tau x y and this gives us a value of d if we compute from this expression we get 53.7 millimeter. Now, this is the value of the diameter of the shaft which is uh, corresponding to the maximum tensile stress of sigma 1 which is equals to 80 mega Pascal. Now, if we have to satisfy the criteria of the maximum shearing stress which is equals to 40 mega Pascal and as you know the maximum shearing stress is nothing but equals to the radius of the Mohr circle which is this and that is sigma x by 2 square plus tau x y square and if we substitute that this is 10 to the power 6 by pi d cube taken out we have root of 19.2 square plus 4.8 square and this gives us a value of 19.8 into 10 to the power 6 by pi d cube. And as you know that limiting shearing stress is 40, from this we get a value of D as 54 millimeter. Now, as you can see that we have computed the value of the diameter from the maximum tensile stress, also we have computed from the criteria of maximum shearing stress. And since both the criteria has to be satisfied because you cannot provide a diameter which will satisfy one and it will not satisfy the other, uh, then naturally it will not uh, stand, it will fail. So, you will have to provide the maximum value of the diameter. Uh, corresponding to the two uh, satisfying both the stress criteria 
and thereby the diameter of the shaft comes as 54 millimeter. So, the shaft diameter has to be 54 millimeter, so that both normal stress and shear stress criteria are satisfied. So, this was the uh, solution for the example which we had uh, given last time. Now, having discussed about this effect of these combined stresses, now uh, let us look into that uh, stability aspects of the column. Now, before you really go into the stability part, uh, let us look into these two aspects as you remember that in the first module we had discussed that we are concerned about the three S's in the strength of material. One we call as the strength and in the strength as you have seen that we have computed the value of the stresses. Say for example, if you have an axial load, axial load divided by the cross sectional area gives, gives you the normal stress. Now, also we have computed the shearing stress for the from the twisting moment or we have computed the uh, normal stress from the bending moment. Now, these stresses as we have seen uh, must withstand the stresses that can be uh, withstand by or that can be withstood by any of the material that uh, we are providing for constructing any of these elements. Now, naturally that says that the strength of that particular material is such that it can withstand these stresses and that is what we have uh, designated as the strength criteria for a particular member. Consequently, we have looked into that if you have uh, a member which is subjected to load, uh, it will be some undergoing deformation. Let us uh, take for example, that when you have a member subjected to the axial load uh, P, we had corresponding deformation delta which was equals to P L by A E. Now, if we like to relate the delta with P, we can write this as P as equals to A E by L uh, times delta. Now, here uh, if we define like this that if we like to have unit deformation, the load which we need is corresponding to this particular term A E by L and this is what we call as the stiffness of the uh, element. That means, this is the axial stiffness of the member uh, which will need this much of load P to produce unit displacement delta or unit deformation delta. Consequently, say for example, in a particular beam simply supported beam subjected to uniformly distributed load, we had seen that delta is equals to P L cube by 40 ATI. Now, here also if I uh, like, uh, write, like to write P in terms of delta, we can write P as equals to 48 EI over L cube uh, times delta. Now, if we like to have unit uh, deformation or deflection, the corresponding load which we need is equals to this amount, which we term as the stiffness uh, of the member. Or if we are talking about the say the twisting moment, as we know that tau is equals to uh, T rho by j and this will again uh, is equals to g theta. Uh, I mean t by j is equals to g t by tau by rho is equals to g theta by l. So, t is equals to g j l by th times theta. Here also if we like to have unit uh, rotation, the corresponding twisting moment that we need is equals to g j by l and that is what is this twisting stiffness. Now, you see in each of these cases as we are looking into that we need the stiffness of the member whether in terms of a e by l or e i by l cube or g j by l they are the characteristics of the uh, member concerned, where the cross sectional area or the moment of inertia or the po polar moment of inertia are introduced or uh, are connected with. Now, so these are the parameters which we call as the stiffness. So, these are the two aspects the strength and stiffness parameter uh, we have already looked into. Now, thirdly the aspect which we are going to look into is the stability of a member. Now, in this particular lesson of course, we will be discussing about the stability uh, with reference to the column member though strictly speaking stability does not mean the uh, stability of column alone, it can be stability of different members as well. But in this particular lesson we will be looking into or in this particular course rather we will be looking into the stability of the column members only. Now, a column member is a member which generally carries an axial compressive load and we call those kind of members as the column members. Now, uh, let us really look into that what we mean uh, by the stability of uh, columns. Now, you know columns we can categorize into three groups, 
one we call as short columns where the axial load is applied to a member in such a way that everywhere we get the stress as you have seen that sigma will be equals to p divided by a the normal stress and this member if we keep on applying this load p uh, will fail by uh, crushing or yielding of the material when the stress will go beyond the permissible value of the material. Another category we call as a long column where the member fails by uh, buckling. Now, let us look into this aspect uh, from this two uh, this very small uh, experiment. Now, here uh, I am considering two members the cross section of which is uh, a rectangular one and they are of the same cross section. If you look into these two members, I have one member which is a shorter length and I have another member which is a little longer length and the cross section of these two members are the same, they are rectangular in nature. If you look into the cross section, they are the identical. Now, when I am talking about this shorter length member, if I am applying the axial load, we will find that the stress at any level will be p divided by the load applied divided by the cross sectional area. Now, uh, if I take uh, the longer member and if I try to apply the load, we will find that this particular member is going to bend in a form and this is what we call as buckling. Now, this particular member uh, uh, as you can see that we are applying the axial load and it has taken a bend shape and thereby it has it has undergone some amount of bending and this is what we call as uh, buckling. So, in case of the shorter member, uh, the stress which we had obtained, they are uh, by the uh, crossing of the member or the stress level at any point goes beyond the permissible value of the material stress. In case of the uh, long columns or in case of the member uh, which is a slender one, when we apply the load P, if we increase this load gradually as you have observed that it takes this particular bend shape and this is what uh, we call as buckling. Now, in this particular shape which is little unstable, if we try to apply a lateral load, there will be deformation and this deformation will be in an unrestrained manner and that is what we call as the buckling, the deformation of the member in an unrestrained manner uh, causes the failure of the member. And we get uh, intermediate columns uh, which can fail by the combination of the crossing and buckling. Now, uh, for this, it is very difficult uh, to arrive at the theoretical basis. So, we uh, resort to some experimental or empirical uh, formulae for evaluating, uh, evaluating the critical load for the uh, intermediate columns. Now, uh, if we uh, try to look into the uh, animation part of it that if you have the member when they are subjected to load as you can see uh, is uh, in a straight form or when the first load is added as you can observe uh, is uh, is in a straight form you see now it is still straight now we have added load uh, it is deformed slightly now if when you add load further it goes in an unrestrained manner Now, uh, let us discuss this uh, stability aspect of column through a model which we call as a buckling model. Now, in this buckling model, uh, we consider two rigid bars A B and B C and they are connected uh, by a pin at point B and at point B we add a rotational spring having a stiffness beta. Now, when this particular member a, B and B, C they are uh, concentric, they are subjected to a load P, it will be in a stable form. Now, if we add a little disturbance to the uh, member, then the point P will move. So, that uh, the deformation which we get, the member will undergo a rotation called theta, which we uh, presume as a small deformation. Now, when this particular member uh, point B moves, then the rotational spring which we have at point B uh, will have some amount of uh, moment generated which will try to bring this uh, member back once we remove the disturbance. That means, this particular moment which will be equivalent to the stiffness times the total rotation that, that these two members undergo 
which is equals to 2 theta. So, the restoring moment for the spring m is equals to beta times twice theta. Now, this particular restoring moment will try to bring these two members uh, in their straight form. Now, if the uh, on the other hand what happens is this particular load P will try to uh, increase this deformation at point B. That means, there will be uh, it will try to increase this rotation theta. Now, as you can see that the effect of the axial load which is trying to uh, deform the member or buckle the member is uh, against or opposite to the restoring moment that is being exerted by the, the rotational spring at point B. Now, this particular model you can compare that with the previous example as I was showing you that you have a long member subjected to axial load. Now, there the bending or the buckling is over the entire length of the member. Now, here the that elastic elasticity is introduced through the rotational spring only. Now, uh, in this particular state uh, if we uh, remove the disturbance it will come back to its original position. Now, if we go to the particular load when so that particular configuration when after removal of the disturbance it comes back to its original position we call that particular state as a stable state. Now, uh, in that undisturbed state again if we keep on increasing this load P uh, a situation will come when the deformation will be large and thereby there will be uh, the member is going to collapse when the restoring moment will not be able to uh, withstand the effect of the compressive load or thereby the load P which will be applied will be greater than the restoring moment that is being offered by the rotational spring and that particular state we call as unstable state. Now, so you see that one state we get as a stable state and another state we get as unstable state corresponding to two values of the axial compressive force P. Now, in between these two state between the stable state and unstable state we get uh, an exclusive value of P uh, which we which is the uh, in fact the boundary between the stable and the unstable state and that load we call as the critical load. And that is uh, I know at that particular load if the member is uh, subjected to in a stable equilibrium position little disturbance in that member can cause the failure of the member and that is why we call that particular load as the critical buckling load. Now, if we like to uh, analyze that what will be the uh, critical buckling load for this particular model, we take the uh, free body diagram of this whole thing, the whole member and if you see that this horizontal force if we call this as H and if we take the moment of all the forces with respect to A, uh, we see that that H is going to be equals to 0. Now, if we take the uh, free body of the top part of the member the part BC. Uh, which is like this where uh, you have the small deformation theta here the axial force P is acting and the restoring moment M and uh, the resistive force P the reactive force P is acting at point B. Now, as we have seen that M is equals to beta times twice theta is the uh, restoring moment as uh, we have called it that when it is uh, it is trying to restore its original position if P is small if restoring moment is larger than the P it will come back to its original position and thereby the column is a stable member if the disturbance is removed. But if this restoring moment becomes smaller than the P or P becomes larger than this restoring moment the member is going to collapse. And so at the at the point when we are uh, calling that P is in the uh, boundary between the stable and the unstable state that means. Uh, at that particular point of time the load is just equal to the restoring moment. So, when axial compressive load P is equal to the restoring moment in this particular model then uh, it will be in a just state of equilibrium and any additional load will cause the instability of the member or the member is going to collapse uh, due to the uh, unstable situation. So, if we equate that that uh, if we take the moment of all these uh, with respect to B and M minus P times now this is theta and this length is L by 2. So, this distance is L by 2 times theta. So, uh, P times 
l theta by 2 minus a or m minus p l theta by 2 equals to 0. Now, this gives you m as equals to 2 beta theta. So, 2 beta minus p l by 2 times theta is equals to 0. Now, here if you see that if we either theta could be equals to 0 or this bracketed term equals to 0. Now, if theta is equals to 0, then naturally uh, this is in a straight form. So, there is no buckling. Now, hence this bracketed term is equals to 0 if we said that that gives us a value of p equals to 4 beta by l and this is what we are calling as the critical load and you see this critical load is independent of theta that indicates that uh, whatever may be the value of the theta the critical load p is equals to the 4 by l times that stiffness the stiffness of the rotational spring uh, which is analogous to the stiffness of the model which we are looking into the long member which you are looking into. Hence, uh, the critical load is equals to 4 beta by L. Now, what does uh, we mean by this particular uh, uh, critical load? This is the boundary between the stable and the unstable situation. If we have load less than P critical, that means the member is in a stable form. That means, once we remove this disturbance, it will come to a perfect state, the perfectly vertical state. And if it is in a such a state if we add disturbance in if it is in the critical load if we add any disturbance to it it is going to cause the collapse or the member will become unstable now uh, so what we need to uh, look into is that the different state which we can uh, compare with this particular uh, situation that if a ball if we, it is placed in a member which is uh, upwardly concave uh, here wherever is the position of this particular ball, it will come back to its lowest position and thereby this is a stable form and that you can uh, plot it with respect to uh, load versus theta if we say this is a theta that means in a stable form uh, once you uh, deform it if you add some disturbance to the member and bring it back it will always bring it will come back to the uh, perfectly vertical position and this is a stable state. Now, uh, this is a state which is unstable that means, at this particular point though at, at this particular point it is stable, but a little disturbance to this can cause the failure of this particular form this will move. That means, uh, at this particular state at a particular state when load has gone to the criticality the member can be just vertical that means, the theta could be equals to 0. So, it is just in a critical state. If we give a little disturbance this way or that way, that can cause the uh, collapse of the whole member and that is what we call as the uh, unstable state and this is what is being represented through this particular diagram here p is greater than the p critical and this particular point. So, this is the unstable state and this is the stable state and this particular one is the neutral state. Now, here wherever you place this position it will always remain in that particular position and that is what we call as the just equals to the critical load this is we call as a neutral position. Now, we can uh, look into this uh, particular uh, form uh, where you see that once we remove this it comes back to its original position because the restoring moment uh, is more than the axial force and that is why uh, the restoring moment is uh, putting it back in its original position. But if the load becomes larger you see that it uh, collapses that means, if the axial force becomes higher then uh, the member collapses. Well, uh, then uh, we come back to our uh, original discussion again after looking into the aspects of the model which we have looked into the buckling model. Now, we are interested to evaluate that what will be the critical buckling load for a member and for that we start with a situation that we have a column member which is pinned at both ends and uh, this is an idealized form of the column uh, where the axial load P is acting perfectly concentric with respect to this member. Now, here we choose the access system in such a way that x uh, goes along the member length and y is perpendicular to this. That means, if we uh, rotate by 90 degree, we get the situation that x is in the positive x direction and y is in the positive y direction as we have assumed for a beam member. Now, the length of the member is L. 
Now, uh, as we have seen that at the criticality, when we reach to the peak critical, the slightly bent form of this member, if we call this as theta, the member can be in the equilibrium state. Beyond which, if we add to this particular state, if we add any disturbance, then it is going to cause a failure of the member. And we are interested to evaluate this critical load corresponding to which it will be in a state of equilibrium. Now, if we take a section at a distance of x uh, from end A from 0, 0 point, then the free body diagram of this particular part of the deformed state of the member is this, where this distance uh, is equals to y at a distance of x. And at this point, you have the reactive force P and the moment M. Now, if we take the moment of uh, all the forces uh, with respect to uh, say at this point, if we call this as uh, D, then moment M plus P times Y is equals to 0 or M is equals to minus P to Y. Now, as we had seen that the, the flexural equation or the differential equation for the for evaluating the deflection of a member on a beam member was E i d 2 i d x 2 which was equals to m and m the bending moment here is equals to minus p y. Now, based on this particular uh, aspects we would like to derive the uh, critical load for this particular member and this derivation was presented by the great Swiss mathematician uh, Leonard Euler in the year 1744, wherein he had uh, uh, given uh, he had given this particular derivation based on which we compute the value of the critical load P critical. And thereby, uh, we generally designate this critical load as the Euler's critical buckling load of a column member uh, or it is a Euler's critical buckling load formula. The expression which we get for evaluating the critical load, we call that as the Euler's critical buckling load formula. Now, let us see how do we get this value of the uh, critical load corresponding to this. Now, as you have seen now E i d 2 i d x 2 is equals to the moment which is equals to minus uh, p times y. Now, if we take this on the other side, we have E i d 2 i d x 2 plus p into y is equals to 0. Now, if we divide the whole equation by E i, we have d 2 i d x 2 plus p by E i times y is equals to 0. Now, we designate uh, p by E i term as equals to lambda square. So, p by E i is equals to lambda square. So, this is d 2 y d x 2 plus lambda square y is equals to 0. Now, if we choose a solution of this uh, y as equals to e to the power m x, then uh, we get an expression that m square plus lambda square e to e to the power m x, this is equals to 0. Now, since e to the power m x equals to 0 will give y equals to 0, which is meaningless. So, m square plus lambda square equals to 0 and thereby m is equals to plus minus i lambda. Now, corresponding to this solution, uh, we have the solution y as equals to uh, c 1 sin lambda x plus c 2 cos lambda x, where c 1 and c 2 are the unknown constants. Now, uh, the boundary conditions which we have for this particular member at this member is uh, pinned at both ends. So, uh, it is hinged at both ends. So, at x equals to 0, the deflection y is equals to 0 of this particular point and that gives us that value of C 2 is equals to 0. And also at x equals to L, the uh, deflection is 0, the deformation is 0 over here. So, at x equals to L, if we substitute y equals to 0, we get C 1 sin lambda L is equals to 0. Now, from this particular expression as you can see that either C 1 can be 0. Now, if C 1 is equals to 0, that means y equals to 0, that means there is no deformation in the member. But, uh, since C 1 cannot be 0 will uh, lead us to a uh, solution that which does not mean the buckling or the deformation of the member, then sin lambda L has to be equals to 0. Now, if sin lambda L equals to 0, uh, it gives that lambda L in a general form is equals to n times pi. So, that means, for different values of pi, pi to twice pi, thrice pi, the value of sin lambda L will be equals to 0. Now, if we square this up, we get lambda square is equals to n square pi square by L square and lambda square as you know is equals to P by E i 
So, p by e i is equals to n square pi square by l square and therefore, p is equals to n square pi square e i over l square. So, we get then p is equals to uh, n square pi square e i over l square. Now, here the minimum value of n, n can have values uh, 1, 2, 3. Now, minimum value of n uh, will lead to the critical uh, load for this particular member and if we substitute uh, n or we take n as equals to 1, then the critical load for this becomes pi square e i by l square. So, if we have load less than pi square e i by l square in a column which is hinged at both ends, then uh, it will be in a stable form and if we go beyond that load then that particular member is going to collapse or fail in buckling. Maybe the stress level could be lower than the uh, yield stress. The P by A if you compute that could be less than the uh, yield stress, but the member will fail in excessive deformation which we call as buckling. Now, this is what is indicated over here. The critical load P C R is equal to pi square E i over L square and this is what we call as Euler's critical buckling load formula or Euler's critical load, P critical is as Euler's critical load. And consequently, as we have seen that C 1 uh, y is equals to C 1 sin uh, lambda x for lambda if we substitute uh, pi l or in a general form as n pi l, this will give you n pi x by l as the equation of the elastic curve. Now, since C 1 uh, is not determined uniquely. So, naturally the value of the deformation which we get is not uh, uniquely defined and so we can have an arbitrary value or arbitrary shape of the uh, particular deformation. And this is what is the deformation shown over here. You see when n is equals to 1, this is the way the member is going to deform and you have the corresponding load as the critical load. Now, when n is equals to 2, uh, we are going to have the critical loads as 4 times p critical. And since uh, it is larger than this critical load, naturally at this point you will have to have some kind of a support, so that you get the deformation in this particular pattern. When n is equals to 3, then the load uh, it can go up to 9 times uh, p critical corresponding to this one and thereby at the third point you need to have some kind of a support and thereby the column can take a shape of this particular form. Now, these are the shapes which we generally call as mode shapes. Now, uh, let us look into the critical load corresponding to a column member where the supports are of different type. Here one end is fixed and the other end is free. Uh, in the previous case we had a member where both ends were pinned or the hinged. Now, here one end is fixed and the other end is free. Now, if that happens uh, at the critical state it may deform in this particular configuration and beyond which if we add uh, uh, disturbance to this particular member, this is going to uh, cause the collapse of the member and thereby corresponding to this state we call the load as the critical load. Now, again if we take uh, a free body of diagram of this particular part which is at a distance of x from the uh, origin which is let us call as A, then uh, this is the free body diagram. Now, at this particular point this distance uh, from here is equals to y and thereby and at the top we have taken the maximum deformation of the member with respect to its original position as delta. So, thereby this particular length is going to be equals to delta minus y. So, if we take the moment of all the forces with respect to this particular point, then uh, we have moment m minus p times delta minus y equals to 0 and this is equals to the value of the moment. Now, if we substitute the value of the moment in this uh, equation differential equation for the elastic curve which is E i d 2 y d x 2 is equals to p times delta minus y, this will give us the d 2 y d x 2 plus p y is equals to p delta. We will have E i d 2 y d x 2 plus p y is equals to p delta. Now, if you divide this by E i, you will have d 2 y d x 2 plus lambda square y because p by e i you have called as lambda square equals to lambda square delta. Now, it, it will have uh, two solutions, one is the complementary solution considering this as 0 and then corresponding to this we will have the particular uh, solution. Now, when this is equals to 0 as we have seen that the solution is equals to c 1 lam, sin lambda x plus c 2 cos lambda x. Now, when you have the right hand side part, we can uh, 
evaluate the particular solution, if we assume say solution y as equals to a x square plus b x plus c in this form, then we will have d 2 y d x 2 as uh, equals to twice a and thereby if we substitute in that we have twice a plus lambda square y uh, which is uh, a x square plus b x plus c this is equals to lambda square delta. Now, if you uh, take the coefficients of x square x on either side uh, since on right hand side we do not have any term on x square and x. So, thereby we will have a as equals to 0 and uh, b also as equals to 0. Now, consequently uh, we will have that lambda square c is equals to lambda square delta and thereby c is equals to delta is the solution. So, we will have y is equals to delta is the particular solution for this particular case and thereby uh, we will have the solution of in this form that y is equals to c 1 sin uh, lambda x and c 2 cos lambda x plus delta. Now, we will have to solve this c 1 and c 2 from the boundary condition and as you can see at x equal to 0 y is 0 here and x equal to 0 y d y d x also is 0 the slope is 0 here and also at x equals to we will have to satisfy x equals to l the y is equals to delta. Now, if we satisfy this now what we get is this that at x equal to 0 y equal to 0 will lead you c 2 is equals to minus lambda and at x equal to 0 d y d x equals to 0 will lead us c 1 is equals to 0 and thereby we get y as equals to delta into 1 minus cos lambda x and we will have to satisfy that at x equals to l y is equals to delta and thereby we get that delta is equals to delta into 1 minus cos lambda l and thereby delta cos lambda l equals to 0 and this gives us that either delta equals to 0 or cos lambda l equals to 0. If delta is 0 then that there is no deformation of the member and there is no buckling and if cos lambda l equals to 0 that gives then the what will be the value of lambda l and lambda l in general will be equals to n pi by 2 uh, from which if we substitute the minimum value of n we get that critical load as equals to pi square e i by 4 l square. So, this is the critical load for a column member which is fixed at one end and free at the other. Now, let us look into the case where the column is fixed at one end and hinged at the other. Now, it is expected that the deformed st state will be in this particular form and uh, if we try to find out the uh, critical load corresponding to this state, this is p critical and since this is hinged end you have the horizontal force h. Now, if we take the free body diagram of this particular part. Uh, these are the moment the horizontal force and the vertical force the reactive forces here. If we take the moment with respect to A we will have m uh, plus uh, p times y, y is the this distance and since we are taking the section at a distance of x from the origin uh, let us call this as b uh, this is l minus x. So, minus h times l minus x equals to 0. So, this is the value of the bending moment m and this if we substitute here we get e i d 2 y d x 2 is equals to m is equals to minus p y plus h into l minus x and this uh, if we take on the other side and divide by e i we have d 2 y d x 2 plus lambda square y is equals to lambda square h by p times l minus x where lambda square you keep in mind as equals to p divided by e i. Now, to write here lambda square we have multiplied with p and divided by p. Now, uh, if we uh, write down the solution for this as you have seen in the previous two cases, the solution of this will be equals to the uh, complementary solution and the particular solution and complementary solution is C 1 sin lambda x plus C 2 cos lambda x and the particular solution is h by p a to l minus x. Now, the boundary conditions are that at x equal to 0 y equals to 0 will lead to C 2 equals to minus h l by p at x equals to 0 d y d x equals to 0 because it is a fixed end that gives us the value of c 1 as equals to h by p lambda and this if we substitute the value of c 1 and c 2 we get the expression for y as this. Also if you look into in this that at uh, x equal to l this is fixed end and this is hinged end. So, you have a deformation in this. So, at x equal to l you will have to satisfy that y is equals to 0. So, if you do that if you substitute that at x equal to l y equals to 0 from this expression we get this form that tan lambda l is equals to lambda l x equal to l means this term goes up 
you have cos lambda l, this is sin lambda l and this is equals to 0. So, that gives us a value of tan lambda l equals to lambda l. Now, this particular equation is solved uh, by trial and we get a value of lambda l equals to 4.4934 and thereby this is uh, when you square this up lambda square uh, l square is equals to this square which is equals to twice pi square. And so, the minimum value of uh, crit, uh, the uh, load p will be equals to 2 pi square e i over l square. So, when a member column member is fixed at one end and hinged at the other the critical load is 2 pi square e i over l square. Now, let us look into the case where uh, we have a member which is fixed at both ends and what will be the critical load corresponding to that. Now, again if we take a, a free body of this particular member at a distance of x, then the forces are like this, you have the bending moment, you have the uh, resistive force, reactive force and at this support you have the moment m. Now, if we take the moment of all the forces with respect to a, then we have m 1 minus m plus p times y equals to 0. So, m 1 therefore, is equals to m minus p y, where m is the uh, support moment as of this particular column. Now, E i d 2 i d x 2 equals to moment which is equals to m minus p y is substituted here and thereby we get again taking p y on the other side, we have d 2 y d x 2 plus lambda square y is equals to lambda square times m by p and again it will have the solution, uh, the complementary solution and the particular solution and thereby the y is equals to c 1 sin lambda x plus c 2 cos lambda x and this is the uh, complementary solution and m by p is the particular solution as we have seen uh, in the previous example. So, uh, this is the expression for y where c 1 and c 2 are the unknown constants are to be evaluated from the boundary conditions. Now, what are the boundary conditions you have here? The boundary conditions are that at x equals to 0, uh, y is 0 and that gives us that c 2 is equals to minus m by p and at x equals to 0 since it is fixed it is dy dx equals to 0 that gives us a value of c 1 as equals to 0 and thereby we have y is equals to m by p to 1 minus cos lambda x. This is the expression for the elastic curve uh, which is y equals to m by p into 1 minus cos lambda x. Also you will have to satisfy that since the member is fixed at both ends. So, at the top end where x is equals to l there both y is equals to 0 and dy dx equals to 0. Now, at x equals to l y equals to 0 uh, gives us that cos lambda l is equals to 1 and at x equals to l if we take dy dx equals to 0 that gives us sin lambda l equals to 0. So, we will have to satisfy both the criteria that cos lambda l should be equals to 1 and sin lambda l should be equals to 0. Now, this can be satisfied only if lambda l is equals to 2 pi or multiple of 2 pi. Now, so the minimum value uh, corresponding to this will be 2 pi and if we square it up we will have lambda square is equals to 4 pi square by l square and since lambda square is equals to p by e i. So, p is equals to 4 pi square e i over l square and thereby the critical load corresponding to the minimum value which is 2 pi is equals to 4 pi square e i over l square. So, you see that we could evaluate the critical load for different uh, members or the, for the column members with different support conditions. First we had evaluated corresponding to the uh, both the ends hinged, subsequently we have seen that if one end is fixed other end is free, subsequently we have seen that one end is fixed other end is hinged and now that we have seen that both the ends are fixed. So, in such cases what are the values of the critical load and as you have seen that in all the cases the values of the critical load as we have obtained they are the function of the, the member properties like the i and l and you have the material property which is e and the l is having some coefficient factor which uh, we can evaluate now. Now, if you look into in general for these cases now you see uh, for the hinged hinged we had p critical is equals to pi square e i over l square where the deformed state was in this particular form. Now, if we try to write down the critical load for all the cases in terms of this pi square e i over l square corresponding to this case where your uh, uh, support conditions are fixed and free you have p critical is equal to pi square e i by 4 l square. Now, let me call that p critical is equals to pi square e i over l 
e square let me call this l e as length equivalent. So, when it is l square l e is equals to l when it is 4 l square l e is basically twice l. So, here that is what is indicated over here. Now, in this particular case it is pi square e i over l by root 2 square and 1 by root 2 is 0 0.7. So, thereby equivalent length here is 0.7 l and in this particular case uh, as you can see that this is pi square e i by l by 2 square. So, l e is equals to 0 0.5 l. So, these are the 4 cases as we have determined and corresponding the effective lengths are as given by this particular uh, call, uh, particular row. Well, uh, we have an example for you which is uh, a rectangular column 3 meter long which is uh, hinged at both ends uh, carries a load of 300 kilo Newton. You will have to determine whether a section of 200 millimeter into 150 millimeter which is a rectangular one will be able to carry this load if we introduce a factor of safety of 3 and the value of E is given as 12.5 GPA. Now, this problem is assigned to you look into this we will discuss uh, in the next lesson. Hence, to summarize uh, in this particular lesson uh, we have looked into some aspects of the previous lesson. Also, we have introduced the concept of the buckling and stability of different types of column members. We have derived the critical buckling load for uh, different types of columns. Uh, different types of columns in the sense uh, we have taken the columns with different end conditions either they are uh, hinged hinged or uh, you have uh, fixed and free or you have the fixed and hinged uh, or you have fixed at both ends. So, these are the possible cases that we can have and corresponding to this we have derived the critical buckling load and uh, well we have given one example and some more examples we will be discussing in the uh, subsequent lesson. And these are the questions uh, set for you that what is meant by critical buckling load of columns? How will you evaluate the critical compressive stress in a column member? And what is meant by slenderness ratio? Uh, look into these uh, questions. Some of the questions you will be in a position to answer from the lessons we have discussed and we are going to give you the answer for this in the next lesson. Thank you. to the second lesson of the ninth module which is on stability of columns part 2. Uh, in fact, in the last lesson we have introduced the concept of the buckling in a member a vertical member which is subjected to a compressive force which we have termed as column and also we have looked into the stability aspects of different types of column members. Uh, we introduced uh, the which was uh, proposed by uh, Leonard Euler which we normally call as Euler's buckling load formula. So, in this particular lesson we are going to look into the aspects that uh, where the Euler's load can be applied or in other words what are the limitations of Euler's critical buckling load.